diverse networks, diverse systems at the community level is fundamentally important for how those systems adapt to change. Hello, one and all, and I'm so glad you're with us today. My name is Andrew Racinos, and I am the president of the Tessitura Network, a nonprofit technology, service, and community company with a simple mission to advance the business of arts and culture. My guest today is Shannon Bennett, Chief of Science at the California Academy of Sciences. The story of this talk began about three months ago when virtually all of Tessitura's 700 cultural organizations around the globe shut their doors suddenly and with very little warning. Never in my lifetime have I seen the arts and culture sector impacted so massively. Watching helplessly, the analogy that kept coming back into my mind was this. COVID-19 felt like that asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. It was swift, devastating, and global. And the more I thought about this analogy, the more I wondered what we could learn, not just from the species that died out, but more importantly, from the species that lived. Were there lessons out in our sector, that lessons for our sector, that we could learn from science about how to survive and thrive and evolve after what is effectively a mass extinction event? And with this in mind, on a whim, I reached out to our friend Jaime Limas, who is the director of IT at the Cal Academy, and asked if they had a curator or a scientist I could pose this question to. Jaime emailed back in record time and he said, so you wanna talk about evolution? You have come to the right place. Well, it was scarcely a week later that I was on the phone with Shannon as she riffed on the topic of extinction and evolution and how that matches with what we're seeing in the culture business today. And I frantically scribbled just about everything she said. Now, as the Chief of Science and Harry W. and Diana V. Hind, Dean of Science and Research Collections for the Cal Academy, Shannon is responsible for the Academy's programs of scientific research and exploration, as well as overseeing the Academy's collection of nearly 46 million scientific specimens from around the world. Shannon's a renowned microbiologist with a specialty in viruses that jump from animals to humans, and she's never been more in demand than she is right now, spending a considerable amount of her days talking about COVID-19 with the scientific community, the media, and the public. And so now, without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Shannon Bennett, Chief of Science, the California Academy of Sciences. Hi, Shannon. Hi. Hello. Welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. It's my great pleasure to share some of my fun uh, science thinking with arts and culture institutions. Oh, great. Well, let's let's jump right in. Um, one of the things that I found most fascinating um, about your backstory is that I learned that your love of science actually started with the arts. And I wondered if you could give us a little bit of background of, of how that happened and, and, and how your career proceeded from there. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. I really uh, gravitated towards theater when I was a young person in high school. Um, I had always been out in nature, kind of a free range child, a lot of camping in my background. And so I loved nature and I loved biology, but I really loved theater as well. And so I went on this adventure when I was in college. I had an opportunity to go to West Africa and volunteer to run a theater program on biology health topics and it was seemed like a match made in heaven it was perfect so i headed off to liberia west africa i was 19 i had some vaccines under my belt anti-malarial medications um, the best training uh, about being safe uh, that i that i had that i had access to at the time and i headed off and within a couple of weeks i came down with malaria um, namely a species of malaria called plasmodium falciparum which uh, can do a lot of damage so uh, it's a very a big killer in africa and a big threat to human health and it had evolved resistance to the anti-malarial medication that i'd been on and everybody said ah oh, that anti-malarial medication is not going to help you these parasites have evolved resistance 
So uh, in the throes of wrestling with this parasite, which uh, was injected into my blood by a mosquito, a night biting mosquito, which I had tried to protect myself from also, I picked up another parasite. Uh, it was called um, Entamoeba histolytica. It causes a disease called amoebic dysentery. If anybody's had uh, Giardia from drinking streams in North America, the water from streams in North America, it's a, it's a bit related, distantly related to that parasite. And it, it basically, you, you get it from ingesting or, uh, or drinking food or water contaminated with uh, fecal material. So it's passed through feces of animals into, into uh, other animals. It can jump into many different kinds of animals. And, and so I became a, a unwitting host of that parasite. And so at, at one point I was not doing so great. And uh, I, I, um, I, I also developed um, an infected uh, cut on my leg. I don't know if it was a mosquito bite or a fall. I can't remember, but uh, I got, um, a staph infection and Staphylococcus aureus is a common bacterium that lives on our skin for many, many people, not everybody. And it's an opportunist. So if it gets into a wound that's not cleaned, it can make hay. So here I was with um, a, a mosquito borne parasite, a fecal orally transmitted parasite that has a broad host range and an opportunist that lives on my very own skin jumping on the bandwagon. And that at that point, the uh, host of the volunteer program sent me to a nearby leper colony uh, to get nursing care. And that was the only place in the area that had any sort of health care. So um, I was in a leper colony and, and leprosy is, is also caused by a bacterium, a very specific kind of bacterium in the genus Mycobacterium uh, that has a much more close relationship with its host that it develops over a long exposure uh, history. So very different. I, I didn't get leprosy but I was surrounded by the impacts of leprosy. And so I had a lot of time, I was sitting there, laying there actually thinking about a mosquito bite that infected me with Plasmodium falciparum, amoebic dysentery, all these different, very different routes that parasites and pathogens can take um, uh, that exist in different forms in natural systems and have different routes to get into and impact humans and then overcoming our our systems in very different ways whether it's uh you know an opportunist that can just pounce uh on our unwitting immune response or something that hides out in our intestines like amoebic dysentery where we can't really tackle it so i at that point i just became fascinated with with what i've since called the art of parasitism mm -hmm. How, how parasites make their way in the world and impact human health and animal health, and decided to come back and dedicate myself to the study of the evolution of microbes, particularly microbes that cause disease, and particularly microbes that jump from natural systems into humans. And here we are at COVID-19. So I feel like I've been building to this point all uh, my whole career. Um, the, yeah. The end note just before I was evacuated from uh, being so ill was that while I was languishing in the leper colony, the first attempted coup uh, prior to the Liberian Civil War in 91 occurred and uh, there was broad spread uh, gunfire, machine gun fire, and many people were um, impacted, harmed. And uh, I heard I heard about I heard it happening, and I was told later that if I hadn't been in the leper colony, which bears all the stigma of leprosy and keeps people away generally, I I may certainly have been impacted, kidnapped, maybe maybe killed. So you could argue that pathogens saved my life, <laughs> but they certainly wow. impact yeah a lot of other people negatively. I mean, it's just it's just such an incredible story, and I guess it just reminds us all that the the narrative of our, of our life we get to tell that narrative and and how how we want to interpret the things that happen to us so having yeah. that incredibly difficult collection of things happen to you as a young person and yet you turned that into your life's work is is really an amazing an amazing story um you talked about pathogens that adapt that evolve that are opportunistic um, and I think about this moment in arts and culture where we are, you know, many of our organizations are, are facing these existential crises all at the same time. Um, 
then the ones that are going to survive and thrive are going to have to figure out how to adapt and evolve and be opportunistic and all of the things you've just you know, not not suggesting that arts and cultural organizations should become viruses and parasites, but perhaps there's something that they can learn. It's a um, successful way of life. Being a parasite is something that's co-evolved or independently evolved across the entire tree of life. Yeah. So there is a story of success there. Yeah, well, I, I wonder, you know, yeah, I mean, in, in our initial conversation, um, we talked about uh, this idea of of taking scientific ideas and and systems that are well documented and grafting them onto the business of arts and culture and seeing what what we could see that could be useful for the folks in our industry. Um, and you really came down to kind of three major markers of resilience uh, and adaptability. And I think when we first talked, you used a forest as an example. Um, and I wondered if you could talk maybe about the first of those of those three traits. Yeah. So, you know, in a nutshell, you cannot evolve and adapt if there if you don't have some inherent pool of diversity uh, at, at hand, uh, because that that's where the, the, the novelty arises from. Uh, how that novelty can then be um, recombined with other novelty, that's part two, generating bigger jumps in diversity through sex, for example. And then how we can build systems that promote uh, diversity uh, to to lead to innovation. That's kind of what I think about as as um, you know having a genetic architecture that allows allows that pipeline to occur. But fundamentally, none of that can can lead to uh, innovation or resilience if you don't have diversity, standing pool of unique characteristics, unique traits. Uh, in evolutionary biology, we look at the genetic diversity of an individual, the genetic diversity of a population or a species, and even the genetic diversity inherent and the other kinds of diversity inherent in a community. And of course, as humans, we are all those things. We are individuals. We are a population of humans bundled in different ways as a single species. And then we exist in communities uh, with other humans and with other animals and other sy natural systems. Um, if you take that analogy uh, to say a forest and you think of a forest as a system, a, a forest is not just a stand of trees. A forest is actually many species of trees, many species of bushes and understory shrubs. Uh, many species of animals uh, that that distribute the seeds of those plants, uh, that uh, microorganisms in the soil and fungi that break down the detritus from those plants, um, pollinators that help the, the plants have sex. And so uh, having a diverse community called a forest. So when we say a forest, we're actually referring to a diverse community of species living together, uh, diverse uh, populations of trees that have different ages and different um, features, and even uh, diversity at the individual level of the tree. And our work at the Academy has shown that diverse networks, diverse systems at the community level of these interacting species and individuals is fundamentally important for how those systems um, adapt to change and here we are you know year on end now we've seen massive hot wildfires sweep through and we're looking at how these forests adapt to a different kind of fire a more intense infrequent kind of fire than they've evolved historically with and measuring how the more diverse that community of that community that makes up what we call a forest is the more likely it is to be uh, resistant to extreme fire events, and then the quicker it might come back as a forest. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about resilience is how do you bounce back and still look like your core, right? Mm. And, and you know, we can make that analogy to the California Academy of Sciences or to an art institution of many kinds is what is your core? And what is your resilience to protect that core, even while you're adapting to new and changing conditions? And diversity yeah. key. 
and I, I think that I think that's it's so fascinating to think about a forest. I know you you told me that sometimes there's man-made forests, like forests that are that are really planted for lumber, and and I think you said that those are the ones that typically don't survive and come back as a forest. Right? Yeah, a monoculture of planted trees of all the same age and all the same species is very um, uh, susceptible to an outbreak of rust. Uh, of many pathogens that can sweep through and take down the entire forest and jump from from tree to tree because they're all the same. Mm -hmm. So it really reduces the the barriers to to disasters like pathogen emergence. Yeah. And and I I can think in arts and culture I can think of sort of three three ways to to, to think about this. There's the there's the human diversity. There's the the background, the racial diversity, the the different kinds of background, socioeconomic background of your teams right of the people who are working at your organization of your audiences of your the stakeholders of your boards um and and the studies that have shown that diversity in those places help you become more innovative because you're, you have a, a diversity of ideas um there's also revenue diversity you know, organizations that rely on um mostly on ticketing revenue and a tiny little bit on fundraising or mostly on fundraising and a tiny bit on on ticketing uh we see those that that have already have a diversity whether it's some retail some ticketing some philanthropy some membership uh chances are not all of those are getting hit at once although in this case they kind of are um and even if I, just thinking about a forest and the diversity of of a community you know no theater no symphony no museum uh, is an island right you know there is the the restaurants there's the parking there's the you know all of the other businesses that that are part of that community that create that experience um we have seen uh, a couple of organizations where if they don't have that diversity around them they're actually much less uh resilient you know when they are literally physically an island almost like out out by themselves um as opposed to those that are that are more embedded in their in their communities um yeah so I think that's yeah you've really um you've captured the you know two two points I want to return to and that is that depending on how you slice and dice diversity you can you can call it out in different ways and the people that make up your system are are the are the diversity that's critical to 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 be the source for novelty uh, novel ideas, for example, novel perspectives, novel life paths, as you mentioned, we all have our own life stories, novel stories, novel experiences that feed ideas different ways. So there's that diversity. And then there's this, um, this another way of slicing and dicing diversity is these sort of different functional uh, cadres, these different um, major groups. So you mentioned revenue sources. And in, in natural systems, there are these bundles of, of functional groups. Uh, there are predators and pollinators and herbivores and detritivores. And depending on the diversity of those functions and the redundancy in the system of many actors carrying out those functions, you can increase um, increase resilience and innovation and your capability of adapting greatly. So you want to have diversity of functions as well as redundancy within those buckets and i think those apply very well to the analogy you raised about different sources of revenue for example oh yeah yeah exactly yeah the revenue redundancy so that if you have a down you know again this this year is unfortunately not it's down all, all over the place but sometimes if tickets you know this particular show didn't do well but because you know a lot of our income comes from contributions we can weather that storm because we've got redundant revenue revenue streams yeah. Um, so it's one thing to have the diversity, it's another for it to interact. Um, right. And I think this kind of leads to your to your next really important uh, thing that we can learn from biological systems. Right. So so you kind of alluded to it. No, no institution, no system is is acting in an island. Mm -hmm. Um and, and occasionally we have these opportunities to recombine different institutional ideas or practices to make something new together. And that is something that happens all the time in nature. In fact, um, we in natural systems, we call it the evolution of sex that as one mechanism to mix up diverse um, units into a whole new, almost 
you know, uber level of new novel diversity. And so uh, what you what you basically want is to recognize that that different units are are building up their own diversity. And then occasionally and periodically, you can recombine those paths. Uh, and in bio biological systems uh, for eukaryotes like like us, uh, we have sex. We recombine our genomes through the re uh, through through procreation, through generating progeny. Uh, bacteria have sex too. They exchange genetic material through something called conjugation. Uh, and even viruses have a version of viral sex to recombine their genomes. And in the case of uh, some viruses like influenza, they're expert at recombining their genomes into new combinations. And almost always that results in an outbreak, uh, whether it's the Spanish flu or the swine flu of 2009, a recombination or a reassortment of um, genetic information in a whole new package, the kind of the viral version of sex was what led to innovation. And for that, in that case, the innovation was being able to jump into new hosts. Um, oh yeah, and this image is actually the um, emergence of the avian, uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, which was also a reassortment of genetic material or a recombination of genetic material from very different influenza strains that allowed it to be much more pathogenic and highly transmissible amongst birds. So, so innovation comes for a virus in expanding your host range, causing um, more uh, virulence, more virus copy numbers in the host. Um, in, in business, it would be, you know, hopefully in, in spreading your positive impact in whole new ways and whole new channels. Right. Yeah, and this is, this is an image showing the, the uh, recombination of the blues and the green viruses in a domesticated fowl that then led to a whole new strain of avian influenza that then jumped out into humans occasionally, but then back into wild birds to cause mm -hmm. a lot of decimation. So from a from a culture perspective, this is this is fascinating because this is taking it, it's a combination of ideas rather than a combination of genes. So you've got you know part one is you have the diversity. So you don't have a stand of trees that are all exactly the same, right? And you don't have right. a staff that's exactly the same, or you don't have a uh, an artistic vision that's exactly the same. Um, and then you are combining those ideas to come out with something new. Um, and this this is sort of I'm trying to remember my Darwin here. Like, and some of the things that come out don't do very well, right? You know, right. Not, not every idea is great. Right. And they die on the vine, or or you know, if you use a theater analogy, like, you know, they close after one night. Um, and right. then every so often you have Hamilton, right? Yeah. Where you've got, you know, you have this this Pulitzer Prize winning book about a founding father, and then you have an incredibly talented, you know, young young guy from Northern Manhattan. Um, who has an idea of how to talk about the story in a new way, and you you have this this international phenomenon that is, that is Hamilton. Um, it's like I think you said shuffling shuffling the deck, right? Shuffling the genetic deck yeah. to create something new. Yeah. Um, and I feel yeah. like you know an, a, another example that uh, another one of of these talks that that I've had in the last month or so uh, was with Annie Burridge, who's the general director uh, at the Austin Opera, and you know, opera, opera companies sort of looking to do new and interesting things will often sit around a, a conference table and talk about opera and other ways to deal with opera. And you'll have like an opera director and an opera singer and, uh, and an opera uh, set designer, right? And what she did is she thought, well, we're in Austin. Austin is a very innovative town. Why don't we, why don't we start an innovation council? And she invited CEOs and, and, and chief creative officers of some of the, you know, the immersive technology companies in Austin to come and visit the opera company and start talking about how they could work together. Um, and one of the results is a, a work that they're working on right now, which is an immersive tech opera that will be partially available online with, you know, using 3D technology and all sorts of things like that, which to me is a perfect example of this diversity of ideas. You've got kind of a very strong opera thought and then you have a very strong technology thought and what can happen if you combine those ideas. Yeah. No, that's a great example. Uh and and to you know to draw it back to the to Darwin, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Darwin described uh finches in the Galapagos Islands with very different beak sizes. 
And some beaks were ideal. We have them in our collections at the Academy and they've been studied extensively. Uh, but depending on the beak uh, robustness and size, uh, it determined how the different kinds of seeds that these uh, birds could, could eat. And so the key point about, um, to bring it back to, to the evolutionary principles, there, were, there was a diversity of different beak sizes in the uh, species of Galapagos finches on the islands. <laughs> but uh, there was then a change. And the change was there was some very big drought years. The, the seed bank changed, became um, harder, harder to, to find seeds. And also they were harder to eat and digest. And so the big build birds were more successful at processing the change in the seeds. And so um, when you um, innovate, when you sort of recombine, when you have the diversity that can then be um, selected for and become, become adaptive to responding to change, you have to recognize that it's an ongoing process. Innovation, you'll always be called on to, to, to innovate. Uh, so, so today in the, in a COVID-19 world, uh, we're, we're suddenly faced with a whole new landscape and our power to respond to those opportunities is because we have the inherent diversity and then we can mix things up in new combinations like you just said, mm -hmm. but we cannot rest, right? Mm -hmm. So things will change again. And so continuing to foster that inherent diversity and thinking about ways to, to cross-pollinate genetic and ideate different ideas, cross-pollinating those ideas across major units like different institutions is really key to building in this ongoing capacity to keep innovating, keep adapting. It's almost like change should, it's almost like change is a muscle that you have to keep working out. Yeah, you know? it's and it's, like a hard, it's a hard <laughs> muscle to work out. Yeah. It's hard. We yeah. resist change inherently. That's adaptive too. Yeah, so it's not going to go away. Yeah, I'm just thinking about those those sparrows on on the Galapagos and and the fact that they had. I I think if I remember correctly, it's because they were in this in, sort of in this remote area, like literally on an island, that they had to sort of adapt quickly to survive. Um, it seems like for arts and cultural institutions, a lot of you know a lot of them already have change sort of built into their mission and and, and their culture, yeah. but some of them don't. Um, and seeing the, the pain of, of sort of churning out that change, you know, we have to, you know, for, for performing arts, we, we have to figure out how to become virtual. We have to figure out how to leverage digital. Um, and yet the leaders I'm talking to right now that have seemed to have embraced it the most say, we're not going back. Like when we go back into our theaters, we're still going to do digital. Now that we've gotten there, now that we've worked out that muscle, we want to keep working it out. Um, yeah. which, which seems like yeah you can't unthink an idea that you've thought about so you yeah. what you want to do is emerge from that and pull forward the things that worked really well before as well as recombining them with the wonderful innovations that you've had and evaluate and mm -hmm. uh, always be in a learning cycle yeah so we've talked about diversity which needs to be combined with collaboration to be useful, which should lead to innovation. Um, but the, And the last part of this, which really blew my mind, and I will admit, it took me a couple of cycles to understand what you were saying, <laughs> but I get it now, is that all of those things by themselves might be useful, but from a um, natural system perspective, there is sort of a greater architecture in the world or in a, in a system that holds all of that together and allows it to prosper. And I wondered if you could, could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so I'd been thinking about this from the point of view uh, of, from my virus background, there are some viruses where their genetic material is all bundled into a single strand. And there are other viruses where the genetic diversity is, is binned into different segments. Uh, similar to the way our, our own genome is bindle, bundled into chromosomes. And uh, in those viruses that have these segmented genomes where they are um, uh, bundled into different forms, they can actually uh, reach further heights of innovation because 
they can do a, a bigger sort of macroscopic reshuffling of their genetic deck on a whole new order of magnitude compared to viruses who just have like a, a single strand of genetic material. And it's much harder to, sure, they, gener they accrue diversity through mutation, but they don't have this ability as much to really recombine and reshuffle information among disparate units to make something much newer. Um, and so uh, that, I, you know, we refer to that as um, different genetic architectures. Mm -hmm. So the genetic architecture of having your genetic diversity bundled into a single strand versus bundled into multiple strands. And then other things like how you might be coexisting in the same host at the same time to, ha to provide those opportunities for reshuffling. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, this is a biological system I'm, I'm describing. There is no architect. Uh, evolution is going on willy-nilly. <laughs> but we do have an opportunity to think about our systems and look to how they're built, the, the architecture of those systems, and see whether there is some way that we can control how ideas, how, how diversity, if we've built our standing diversity, which is fundamental, can then be uh, you know, really uh, leveraged and energized in, in, in institutional, institutionalized ways that allow greater innovation and, and, and give greater voice to that diversity, uh, which we're all struggling with now is um, the shock of realizing that we have not done nearly enough to promote diversity in our institutions and give diversity a voice and uh, it's, you know, it's a disaster. So we definitely recognize that we need to do some, do so much more. Um, and so this is a great time to think really hard about how uh, we want to build, institutionalize, um, basically design architectures, put those in place to bring up diverse voices and recombine diversity to really reach new heights of innovation and progress. Yeah, no, I couldn't say it better myself. I mean, it's it's being intentional about it and yeah. it's it's not leaving it to chance. Um, right. one, one of the papers you had me read, and um, I can't believe that I was reading scientific papers. It made me feel very cool. Although I, I only understood about 80% of the words. Um, well, I, I had to, I had to look up some of them, but it was a study by one of your colleagues um, of uh, paleo uh, biology. So I'm yeah. getting I'm getting the words wrong, but good. No, no, paleo paleobiology is perfect. Yeah, yeah hun hundreds of millions of years ago, and looking at the fossil yes. record and seeing how these systems have worked or not worked over time when there are mass extinction events, and sort of yeah. bringing it back to where we started of we're sort of staring at this potential extinction event for arts and culture. Um, and how, you know, even though you say there's no real architect, there is almost like this meta architect. There, there's an example of they can see in the fossil record that that there was at one point a lot of carnivores and not a lot of herbivores, for instance. And the and the overall kind of system let some of the carnivores go extinct because it was out of balance, right? That like it wasn't diverse enough, actually. And and uh, I'm not going to continue to draw that analogy out, but I thought that was interesting that there's almost a bigger, there's a bigger meta system at, at work. Um, I think when I think about architecture in that way, whether whether it's the architecture of a forest or the architecture of a coral reef, um, you can also think about the architecture of an organization that has um, a mission and it has a culture and it has a structure and it has leadership that can not only say that something like diversity is a good idea, but actually build it in to how, how they operate from the literally like written down in the, in the charter of, of how they work. Um, and whether that is racial diversity, whether again, that is revenue diversity. Um, I think to me at the end of the day, this part is almost the most important part. You need to have diversity, you need to have collaboration. Um, those will lead to innovation. And then you need to have the architecture which basically allows, promotes and, and says that, you know, that we recognize that we're gonna be the most healthy company possible or arts yeah. institution or cultural institution possible if we promote all of these things. So it brings yeah. it back to home. Yeah. 
No, that's great. And I'll only say uh, about um, Peter Rupnerin's work uh, that that uh, the the a system that's dominated by carnivores uh, will will be lacking the diversity of those functional groups, um, sort of a distribution of redundancy across different bins, and mm. be over dominated by carnivores. So, just to I'm going to just pull back on the you use the mm. word let it let it mm. go extinct. It's yes. there's no anthropomorphization going right, on right, here. Right. Right. Just, right. It goes extinct because it's lacking diversity. Um, mm. at, at, uh, a nice, uh, healthy distribution of species across multiple functional groups, where um, it would need to have that to respond to change. And that that mm -hmm. system, you know, could have gone on maybe for quite a while. But these, uh, but Peter is studying them in the context of these mass extinction events, these huge mm -hmm. changes on a whole scale, uh, that you you can just watch the system fall apart because it mm -hmm. doesn't have the diversity and redundancy that it needs to innovate past or and adapt to the new conditions. And well, here good. we are, <laughs> COVID-19. Right, yeah, 400 million years later. Yeah. Um, you know, we're getting to the end of our time. Uh, Shannon, I can't thank you enough. Um, I think sort of a, a, a final summary is that in order to survive, Cultural organizations need to adapt and be resilient. And in order to adapt and be resilient, they need to be able to combine new and different ideas. And in order to combine new and different ideas, they need to have diversity at all levels of, of how they think and how they work uh, conceptually as an organization. Um, exactly. And, and all of that, we have nature to thank <laughs> for, for help, helping we us. We are nature. Us. Yeah, and, and yes, we have ourselves to thank, really. Right. <laughs> um, but I have you to you thank. I know that you, inner nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you you are you are forever a member of the Tessitura Network as a, somebody who started out as a theater artist and became a scientist. Um, we uh, we thank you for your time. I know you're very busy and and for your really interesting thoughts um, on how we can all learn and grow from this. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. You're very welcome. I love I love exchanging ideas with a different perspective and a different group. We're putting in practice what we preach. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity. And I'm honored to be a part of this family because you guys are awesome. Oh, thank you. We'll take care until we speak again. <laughs>